What's Oklahoma's identity heading into the 2022 season? Brent Venables had a lot to say at the Coach's Caravan. We'll touch on a few of those things. we got some news and notes coming in the third segment on today's episode of Locked On Sooners. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, Sooners Nation, and welcome to today's episode of Locked On Sooners. Thank you for joining us. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online is where the game starts. Thank you for joining us. My name is John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John9Williams. And joining me as he does every single day is Josh Helmer. You can follow him on Twitter at JoshOnRef. You can also hear him Monday through Friday from 9 to noon on 94.7 The Ref in Norman, 1400 Sports Talk in Oklahoma City, and on the 1400 Sports Talk app. Josh, how's it going, man? All over the place, baby. Worldwide. Just like this, Locked On Sooners right here, which is, uh, of course, an easy download. And thank you for joining us. I'm great, my man. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Hey, and if you're into more high school soccer, then you can also uh, check out. It's more, right? Or Norman? Uh, Norman and more. Yeah. yeah and I, I, I don't know if I can share the news yet, but probably some other programs as well here shortly. So. Awesome. That's great, man. Uh, if you're into high school soccer, make sure you check them out and check out the work there. Love it. Love high. I love soccer in general, so it's fun to, to know my buddy here is, is calling those games. So, Josh, got some interesting things to talk about. First of all is a story that Brad Crawford, 247 sports writer, wrote about the things he's most concerned about with each of the national title contenders heading into the 2022 season. He titled it The Things He's Worried About. And for the Oklahoma Sooners, he mentioned just the identity. And this is something I think that shows up with most most coaching changes. You don't really know what that team is going to look like until they take the field. But I I think you and I are both on the same page in that Brent Venables was pretty clear about what he wants the identity of his football team to be. But let's look at what Brad had to say uh, in his piece. I aggregated it over at the Sooners Wire. You can also see more of my thoughts over there. But he said, the Sooners seemed to lack toughness on defense last season. That's 2021 leading to the first time Oklahoma failed to win the Big 12 in several years. The program hired the right man to fix those issues in defensive guru Brent Venables, and now his job is to quickly establish an identity and change the mindset at a program primarily known for big plays at a fast pace on the other side of the ball. Oklahoma should be fine offensively with Jeff Levy calling shots for a group orchestrated by former UCF star Dylan Gabriel at quarterback, but if this team is elite, Venables' unit of Unit of defense will be the reason. So, Josh, just initial thoughts, initial takeaways from what he had to say there. You know, the more I've stewed on it and and read it and thought about it, I don't have, I think, as big of a problem as I did initially. Quite frankly, when I first read and saw that, I thought it was just kind of a lazy take. It was not really defining any sort of position group that could be a problem area for Oklahoma and pinpointing the fact that you've had a head coaching change in Brent Venables and saying, well, he's got to establish an identity. Well, no, duh, he's got to establish an identity. Any new head coach, any new assistant coaching staff needs to establish an identity. So from that, from that perspective, I did think kind of a little bit lazy with all due respect to Brad Crawford, who I think generally does a really good job and provides a lot of content for the U's and I's of the world. So thank you, Brad, for that. And I'm sorry to blast you here. I, you know, to me, he's right in what he said, that if this season is regarded as a resounding success for Oklahoma, then Brent Venable's defense and the types of strides that they made on that side of the football will be the biggest reason why. I guess for me, I'm always, always a little bit of a stiff arm to the let's have the leadership conversation who are the leaders on this team uh you know the the identity being you know character driven every football team should have good characters and leaders on it and those players will naturally identify themselves so for me when I start thinking about what is the biggest weakness to an Oklahoma I'm probably still in the camp that to me it's how the offensive line comes together that was a group that wasn't great in 2021 And you lost a couple of guys to the National Football League 
We've talked about Anton Harrison. All of a sudden, he's generating some first-round NFL draft buzz, which to me still sort of feels like it's coming a little bit out of left field with Anton Harrison. So if you ask me, okay, what's the the you know biggest problem area for Oklahoma? It would be offensive line, or I think you know what he's talking about with the defense. If you want to have it on that side of the football, it's got to be the secondary making strides, right? I mean, they were terrible last season. Yeah, they were one of the worst teams in the Power Five against the pass. And I think you're right. I think there there are other reasons to question this team heading into the 2022 season. I think establishing an identity is not really it. And Brent Venables, in his initial you know uh, press conference at the, uh, the ceremony to unveil Oklahoma's new head coach, he said what he wants this identity to be, and I think the players have really caught on to it. I love my players, past and present. They'll tell you that. I'm going to coach him really, really hard. But I'm going to love him more. I'm going to love him more. We will employ an exciting, fast, explosive, and diverse offense combined with a physical, punishing, relentless, suffocating defense. And so what he's looking to do on both sides of the football is attack. He wants to attack on offense. He wants to attack on defense. There's not going to be much conservative play calling on either side. They're looking to establish their will as a football team on both sides of the ball, and they're not going to play scared. And he, he mentioned it, relentless, suffocating defense. And I think that's really what it's going to be on the defensive side of the football. We saw it a little bit in the spring game. This was a, a defense that was flying around a little bit there were very few times that I remember where it was just one guy getting to the ball carrier. There were multiple guys getting there. And I think that's a sign of a team and a, and a defensive unit that is looking to play fast and play together and play with that relentless attitude where I don't care where I'm at on the field, I'm getting to the ball carrier. I don't care if I'm on the opposite side, you know, you know, trying to cover this guy who's now a blocker. I'm going to make my way over to the D, the other side of the field to, to get to the ball carrier. So I, I agree with you. I think there's a little bit of a kind of a misnomer. You know, you can say this about any new head coach at a new program, whether it's Dan Lanning at Oregon, Mario Cristobal at Miami, Brian Kelly at LSU. I think maybe a little bit of the, of the difference might be that, you know, he's a first time head coach, you know, him and Dan Lanning are going to be kind of lockstep in, in how they're compared being it's Dan Lanning's first head coaching job as well. But I think we know what Brent Venables is going to be. We've seen him as a coach, a defensive coordinator for 20 years, 20 plus years now. We know what he's about, and he's going to make the Oklahoma Sooners about that as well. That's the hope, right, is that the identity is everything that he laid out right there. That quote that sticks with us from the introductory press conference, which – Oh, by the way, if he goes on and wins a national championship, not here right now necessarily in 2022, though that would be a welcome sight at any point in his Oklahoma tenure and beyond. If he wins one, if he wins multiple, that's going to be that quote that we go back to. So any way that we can find a way to just kind of integrate that in in tonight's show and tomorrow's show and uh, any show moving forward, good way to get everybody fired up. But that is it, though. That I mean, that's the identity that he wants to create. Relentless suffocating, punishing defense, which has been sorely lacking at the University of Oklahoma for a while. We've seen glimpses of some pretty good defense at times. The Ohio State performance comes to mind in Columbus. I'm sure we could look at a couple of others. Of course, there's been great individual plays. Trey Brown's safety against Texas a couple of years ago in the Big 12 championship game. So not that you've been totally devoid of defensive playmakers or some great individual defensive plays, but collectively – we just haven't seen Oklahoma defensively be what Oklahoma historically defensively is. So that's the identity. And I don't think that's just specific to the defensive side of the football. I mean, relentless, suffocating, physical, punishing. I mean, that's both sides of the football. That's the identity. Well, and that fits his personality. Like, that's who he is. He's a relentless dude who he mentioned it in the clip. He's going to coach his players hard and he's going to love them more. Like, that's the kind of guy he is, just a relentless presence as a coach. He's always got this energy that I'm like, can you give me some of that? Like, I would love just an ounce of what you're, you've got going on for you, Brent Venables. So if you're, if you're looking to market your energy, let's figure out a way to do that. Uh, we, can, we can sponsor here on Locked On Sooners. 
really what it's going to come down to is wins. Like he's going to have to win and that's going to create and help solidify what he wants Oklahoma football to be like. And I don't see any reason why he won't. This is a, a pretty solid team. Every team in the big 12 has got question marks. There are some good teams in the big 12. Texas is going to be one of them, but I think Oklahoma is going to be right there and they're going to be contending for the big 12 championship just like they seem to do every single year, because that's what you get at the University of Oklahoma. Coming up next, we got to talk about what Brent, Ven- Brent Venables had to say at the Coach's Caravan stop in Amarillo about the recruiting side of things. We'll talk about that after I talk to you about Bet Online. Bet Online is the number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including this year's basketball playoffs, Major League Baseball scores, fights, and even next season's NFL futures. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. So head to the website today. Use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. You can get in on who's going to win the Big 12. The Oklahoma Sooners are right now the favorite at plus 175. Uh, so you lay $100 on Oklahoma, you'll get $175 back. If you like those odds, go to betonline.net where the game starts. And thank you so much for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts, as well as YouTube. Subscribe to the show over there. So Josh, making the stops across the Oklahoma region, down in Texas, or I guess West in Texas, because Amarillo is not really down, but uh, Brent Venables, the rest of the big name coaches for the University of Oklahoma out on the on the trail, kind of garnering support, really pep rallies uh, for different pockets of Oklahoma fan bases. But Brent Venables had some really interesting things to say about recruiting. And uh, let's just look at a few of those quotes. If you're on YouTube, I'm going to put these quotes up for you, but I'll read them otherwise. Um, sorry, this is the first one that we thought was really interesting. He says, people are contagious, good and bad. I want to make sure we don't bring any bring in any energy vampires, right? Guys that are always miserable. Something's always wrong. They always make an excuse. So Josh, first thing, what a great analogy. Energy vampires, like somebody who's going to just suck the life out of people, suck the life out of a program. Man, that one really hit home for me. Yeah, no, I mean, it's fantastic. We need t-shirts. Don't want no energy vampires. I don't know what. However you use the phrase energy vampire please i i want my shirt with brent venables and the visor or whatever uh you put on that that's going to be fantastic and it is it's it's a great analogy for what he doesn't want in the oklahoma program moving forward and, and he does seem to across the board when likeness just the types of personalities and characters that he wants to bring into this program he's got a great idea across the board for what his vision of an Oklahoma football player, what that looks like, the the types of players and families that he wants to be a part of OU, that he wants to bring into Norman and to sign for Oklahoma. Yeah, you don't you don't want an energy vampire? Are you kidding me? I mean, John, how terrible would this show be if one of us, every time we got up to do this show, was just grumpy and frustrated and didn't really show the signs of wanting to be here? We have fun, right? There's no energy yes. vampires on Locked On Sooners, and you don't want that in a locker room either. So, no, I thought it was a fantastic analogy and really rings home. Yeah, I think if there's one thing that can really cripple a football team, it's it's poor chemistry. And that poor chemistry can come from just one guy, one bad apple, sowing seeds of, seeds of dissent, seeds of doubt, seeds of distrust in the coaching staff. And not, that's not going to – that's not to say that you're not going to have, you know, guys that aren't going to necessarily fit right away. But I mean, you just got to have guys that are moldable, guys that have the personalities to be coached, to be taught. You know, like, I, so I'll go back to when I was in high school choir. Like, I joined high school choir in my junior year. I needed a credit. My, my choir teacher, she asked me, Hey, so why did you join choir? I said, Well, I need a credit. And she's like, Well, I hope it becomes more than that for you. Like, a lot of guys, they're playing football just because that's all they know. Like they're playing football because that's just the next thing they need to do. They went from high school to college. Like, okay, I'm just going to play football. Well, I think what Brent Venables is looking for, he's looking for guys that are going to have passion for the game. He's looking for guys that are going to bring energy and something positive to contribute to that locker room, to that team. And, and I think that that means something. You know, when I started choir, I didn't necessarily like love it. By the time I finished it, my senior year, man, I loved it. And I almost majored in, musical theater or choir or 
the vocal performance coming out of high school because I loved it so much. And I think that's what he's looking for is like, hey, you may not be as bought in as this other guy, or you may not show the same passion as this other guy, but I bet by the time we're done, you're going to be on that same plane. You're going to have the same passion, the same energy, the same positivity, the same just you know fruitful outlook about this program. Because here's the thing that I really loved about what he said next. And he says, that's why we don't want to force a commitment because once they commit, they're ours. I tell the coaches, don't have buyer's remorse. Once you make that decision, it needs to be till we graduate. Man, I love this. Like to me, this is Brent Venables, not just getting a commitment from a player, but committing to the player. Like we are lockstep, hand in hand, from the time you step on campus to the time that you graduate. You, you and I, we are one. Like he's he's viewing this like a marriage, like a marriage covenant. Not to use like too many spiritual words here, but like a covenant is something that's an unbreakable bond something that is a, a contract between two people committed to one another to see the best in one another and to bring out the best in one another. And I think that's what Brent Venables is looking for. He's like, not only am I looking for you to come play football for us, I'm looking for you to be committed to a process and to a program. But at the same time, we as a coaching staff, we're going to be committed to you. And he said, he said it all along since the first time he stepped off the plane in Norman, we are going to love and be committed to players and seeing them become the best versions of themselves for life beyond football because football ends. It's, it's not something you can do forever. So he's trying to holistically coach and bring up these players in a way that is going to benefit them, not just on the football field, but for the rest of their lives. And I love this, man. I love this about Brent Venables. It's one of my favorite things about him. I think that's great, the way that you put that. It, it is sort of like the covenant of marriage, at least – the, the commitment portion of it, right? And in today's world of recruiting, what it's become, and I'm not talking name, image, and likeness. I mean, even before name, image, and likeness, a commitment has become devalued, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not as important as it used to be. Not to say that in the 60s, 70s, 80s, whatever, you Oklahoma football historians out there, I know that you can throw plenty of examples, both John and mine, uh, John and I's direction on guys that Oklahoma either flipped late in the process or vice versa happened to Oklahoma. But we see it more rampantly today than ever before where you flip a commit positively or negatively Oklahoma, any college football program you want out there. And so I do like the fact that it's, Hey, if we're committed to you, you're committed to us. And, and there is emphasis on the word gotten hollowed out and forgotten a little bit here in, uh, you know, recent years, just with the way recruiting has changed. One other thought on, on this quote, the energy vampire thing from Brent Venables. I mean, are you kidding me? That was so good down at Amarillo. And the rest of the Sooner Caravan schedule, by the way, looks like this for those that are curious. May 12th in beautiful Duncan, Oklahoma. Then off to Houston, May 17th. Dallas, May 19th. My hometown of Wichita, Kansas on May 24th and then at the Omni and OKC on May 26th. And the reason I bring up those dates is, number one, to inform, but number two, are you kidding me? That type of quote, you're getting that from the coach's caravan? That just tells me, John, that Brent Venables, his coaching staff, and I'm sure it's the same case for Porter Moser and Jenny Baranchek and anybody that's a part of the Sooner Caravan. Toby Rowland in seeing it, you know, he takes it very seriously. But your head football coach, is taking that very seriously. He knows you've made an investment to pay to get to the Suter Caravan. And just from that quote alone, I can tell John that he's taking it very seriously. So I just thought that was worth touching on. And I think it's very, very cool. Yeah. Hey, to all my Duncan friends, I used to live in Duncan for about three years, a few years back. So all my friends out there, make sure you go hit up Brent Venables, go to the coach's caravan, say hey to Porter Mosier, Jenny Baranchek, let them know how you feel about Oklahoma and where it's headed, because there's a lot of exciting things go to the Coach's Caravan. You can find more information about that over at Soonersports.com, so check that out as well. Josh, coming up next, we got a ton of news and notes that came out on Tuesday, Wednesday, just so many things that we got to touch on. We'll do that here after a quick break. So, Josh, first team, all Big 12 softball awards were handed out, and the Oklahoma Sooners had six players, three, three, 
on the first team ballot alone. They had one on the second team. So your first team, all Big 12 players, uh, Jocelyn Allo, of course, Tiara Jennings, of course, Grace Lyons, of course, because she's been phenomenal this year. Uh, Jada Coleman, again, another phenomenal season for her, both at the plate and defensively. Uh, Jordy Ball, your freshman phenom, who's going to be in line for uh, freshman player of the year across the nation. She also won freshman of the year uh, for the Big 12 and co-pitcher of the year with Kelly Maxwell of Oklahoma State. And, um, oh, I feel like I'm leaving. Oh, Hope Troutwine, another phenomenal pitcher for the Oklahoma Sooners, leads the country in earned run average. I still don't think it's above a .10 earned run average. And then Alyssa Brito makes the second team all Big 12. Uh, Jocelyn Allo was the player of the year for the Big 12. Patty Gasso was the coach of the year for the 10th straight season. I mean, just name it the Patty Gasso Award at this point. Uh, Grace Lyons was the Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year. Just an incredible feat by the Oklahoma Sooners. Again, six first-team selections. Alyssa Brito, the second-team selection. And they either owned or co-owned every single individual award. And it shouldn't really come as much of a surprise because the 45-1 and one Oklahoma Sooners, the best team in the country for now two years running, they're that dominant, and they should be recognized as such. That's crazy. I mean, the fact that they have won this league 10 consecutive years in a row, when, you know, in the past, Texas was a dominant force game of softball. If you want to strip it down to just Texas, you can do that. But there's been some other good programs in this league, and nobody's been able to knock Oklahoma off that perch. And so as a result, Patty Gasso, as you mentioned, 10 straight years as the coach of the year in the conference, I mean, that is incredible. The the run that she and the Sooners have been on, every single player that was first team, second team, all very deserving. Um, again, I mean, w- what can you say about Oklahoma softball that hasn't been said? Dominant program, every single player that earned accolades, 100% deserve those. You probably could have picked one or two players that you felt got snubbed on the Big 12 awards. Yeah, I mean, Kinsey Hansen, like – probably should have been represented somewhere on this team for her play behind the plate, as well as her play uh, at the dish and swell. So at some point we're going to have to have a conversation at where Patty Gasso stands in the coaching hierarchy, not just at Oklahoma, but just in all of sports. Like I feel like all in all of college sports, she's got to be up there with some of the greats of all time. We'll have to have the conversation at some point this off season, but uh, another important nugget we got to touch on, the Oklahoma Sooners added another wide receiver through the transfer portal, this time Javian J.J. Hester from the Missouri Tigers. Now, he comes, he's a Tulsa guy, went to Broken, uh, sorry, Booker T. Washington High School. Uh, so he's an Oklahoma kid coming back to Oklahoma. He's excited about that, ready to make his return to Norman. And uh, he didn't play a ton, played in seven games for the Tigers in 2021, redshirted his freshman year in 2020 was a uh, big, the number three player in the 2020 recruiting class, uh, had 12 receptions for 225 yards and two touchdowns, uh, averaged 18.8 yards per reception. According to Pro Football Focus, he averaged 1.76 routes, uh, yards per route run, 6.6 yards after the catch, and a depth of target of 14.7 yards, which was that average depth of target was the third best number for the Tigers last season. So really limited playing time, but when he got on the field and he was able to run some routes, he was actually pretty productive for the Tigers. So a really interesting option, 6'3", 170. The dude, I mean, he's got solid size, played predominantly in the slot. 75, 70% of his snaps were in the slot uh, for Missouri last year. So how do you feel like this might figure into the Oklahoma Sooners death chart? That's a good question. Where, where do these wide receivers wind up? You know, Marvin Mims has played both inside and out. So if you could tell me definitively that Marvin Mims was playing in the slot or Marvin Mims is playing outside, I might have a better indication on maybe what that means right here. Uh, Mm -hmm. Obviously, I just, you know, for me, think about the fact that throughout the course of the entirety of the end of last year and then this offseason, Mario Williams, you you lost at the wide receiver position. Jaden Hazelwood, you lost at the wide receiver position. And add in, if I'm missing somebody, Cody Jackson, you lost at the wide receiver position. So just from strictly, you know, adding depth 
to your program. I think this is huge for Oklahoma. You did get a couple of good ones with Nick Anderson and uh, Jaden Gibson in the 2022 signing class. But, I mean, basically, now it kind of feels like you you added a third four-star in this 2022 signing class with the addition here of JV and Hester. He was a four-star kid coming out of high school, number 45 wide receiver, according to what I'm looking at right here from 24-7 Sports, was the third-rated player from the state of Oklahoma. So talented wide receiver and Oklahoma they needed that depth, John, after some of the defections that they've had. So where does he wind up shaking out for the Sooners? I still feel like very clearly Mims and Weiss are one and two here. But then after that, you've got Jaleel Farouk. You've got Drake Stoops, who's done some really nice things at Oklahoma. And you've got a couple of rooks in Anderson and Gibson. So, I mean, he's going to have his chance to factor in heavily, I think. But in terms of that hierarchy beyond, you know, Mims and Weiss, I, I'm not totally sure yet. Yeah, I, I figure he probably fits into that third, fourth, fifth wide receiver discussion. You know, wherever that kind of lands. I think with Jaleel Farouk, we liked what we saw in the bowl game out of him. His spring game was a little bit underwhelming for me. Um, I feel like he could have played a little bit better. But again, it's a spring game. There's plenty of time for him to make up for that. And, you know, it's really was his first big opportunity to, to get an extended run uh, as an Oklahoma Sooner, you know, since the spring game. But that's like two times since he played in high school. So I'll kind of chalk that up a little bit to just inconsistent playing time. And we'll see what happens in the fall. But I think it, at least it gives you a, a guy with some some experience to be quality depth for depth for you. Uh, he can play inside. He's got the size to play outside if necessary and just kind of factors in as, you know, like I said, in that third, fourth, fifth wide receiver could probably back up on the outside, on the inside, but competing for snaps with the guys that you mentioned a- along with a guy like Trayvon West or Brian Darby who are still with the program as well. So it's, it's an interesting ad. I think it's a solid addition, a guy with a little bit of upside that just hasn't had his potential fully untapped just yet. Uh, so a really interesting addition there. Uh, Oklahoma softball to get back to them. They're going to open or they'll play the winner of who was it? It was Baylor and Iowa State. Iowa State thank you. Um, at one o'clock on Friday for the their opener in the Big 12 tournament. I think most people expect them to roll through the Big 12 tournament, but they'll face some challenges. They did with Baylor a few months ago and Texas handed them their only loss of the season. Oklahoma State played them tough as well. So it'll be an interesting Big 12 tournament as well. TCU baseball or sorry, Oklahoma won the series against TCU baseball this last weekend. We hadn't mentioned that yet this week, but it really positioned them to potentially make a run and get a a berth in the college world series, or at least into the regionals aspect of that, Josh. It did. And I'm sorry, I'm trying to get you an official college baseball RPI update on what it did for Oklahoma. They're safely in Oklahoma baseball is which, you know, a lot of years that hasn't really been the case for OU. 31 right now, your up-to-date RPI baseball rankings for Oklahoma. So, no, that was a huge win. TCU is a really good ball club uh, for the, you know, in the Big 12 Conference. So that was a great series win for the Sooners. To me, barring just a total collapse, I think they're pretty safely in the NCAA tournament, which is a big-time accomplishment for Skip Johnson and co. The softball side, you mentioned the Big 12 tournament. You know, I don't think there's anything that can happen in the Big 12 tournament for Oklahoma where they're not the number one overall seed now. Lost just the one game on the season. Nothing that happens in the Big 12 tournament positively or negatively to me impacts that. I don't think – and maybe the better way to say it is, I don't think there's anything anybody else can do nationally to catch the resume that now Oklahoma has got with the regular season concluded. So I think they're the number one overall seed. And Oklahoma baseball for them, I think they're pretty securely, squarely in as a three seed, trying to the, you know, home stretch here, their regular season, and then into their Big 12 tournament, which will be a couple of weeks down the road. They're trying to keep that arrow pointed up and get to potentially a two line. So a lot of exciting things happening for the Oklahoma Sooners. Got a few recruiting tidbits I wanted to share with you a little bit. Uh, So Oklahoma ended up in the top five for four star defensive lineman Kelby Collins out of Alabama. A lot of things, projections are kind of pointing to um, Alabama for him, but he's a a four-star defensive lineman that has a relationship with 
uh, Brent Venables and Todd Bates dating back to last summer, we've seen Oklahoma go into recruiting battles where they weren't the favorite and come out on top. We, we talked about it in the last segment. They are more than capable of flipping some guys, uh, but a really powerful guy with a lot of talent. Um, and then another one that, to me, this is the more exciting one, at least for the offensive side of the football, because I love the wide receiver position. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a sucker for it. But uh, they landed a recruiting projection from uh, Sam Spiegelman of On3 that's going to have Anthony Evans the third heading to Oklahoma. He's a 2023 wide receiver, three-star player. And that's something else I want to touch on that maybe we can touch on it on tomorrow's show is Brent Venables being unafraid to target three stars and look for those diamonds in the rough, the guys that might be being under-recruited but have a ton of talent. Anthony Evans, the dude, is a speedster, a la a Marquise Brown a little bit, a guy that can get over the top, threaten defenses down the field, and can make big plays happen when he gets it in the short area of the field as well. So that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Sooners. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. We're free and available on all platforms. Make sure you follow Josh on Twitter, at Josh on Ref, and myself, at John9Williams. And until next time, we'll catch you later. Boomer Sooner.